Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mike Rathie, and I'm a personal injury lawyer here in Atlanta, Georgia. And my goal today is to tell you things that I know, tell you everything I know uh, about at least the first part of bad faith. So to give you an outline of where I'm going, I want to walk through what the heck is bad faith, because I hear so many different definitions of it. I hear so many different ideas of what it is and what it isn't. And I want to clear some of that up, at least what I think. You all can tell me why I'm wrong. I then want to walk you through the process, the process of bad faith. What the heck you do when you think that the insurance company failed to act reasonably in settling a case. And then I'm going to bring on my good friend, Austin Bersinger. Um, he, this is his world. He was on the defense side for a long time helping insurance companies, uh, defending them, and representing them in bad faith cases. He now does the opposite. So he's going to be a good resource for us. And we're going to walk through how you actually go about drafting a bad faith demand and what happens after a decision is made from the insurance side. Uh, so I, I am probably talking a mile a minute because I am really, really excited about this one. So Stick with me, ask any questions you want in the comments. Um, if you haven't joined one of these webinars before, welcome. I'm so glad to have you. If you're watching live, uh, it's incredible that people, that, that y'all are willing to spend an hour of your time in real time with me. If you're watching later on YouTube, that's awesome too. Uh, feel free always to reach out to me, ask me any questions, anything you need, and I'm happy to help. So for some idea here about, about, so you at least know that I know, maybe, what I'm talking about. We handle about 20% or something of our cases, maybe 25, involve some component of bad faith. So we're dealing with this on a, on a regular basis. Um, and we're dealing with the concept of bad faith as well as uh, addressing what happens when we think we have a case where an insurance company acted in bad faith. Um, so what the heck is bad faith? I really don't love, I really don't love the, um, the phrase bad faith because it, the insurance company doesn't technically have to act badly, badly. They just have to put their interests ahead of their customers. So let's start back with the premise of insurance. And I'm not going to bore you, I promise. Um, the idea is that insurance companies must protect their customers. Customers pay all this money um, every month, uh, maybe six months, whatever you pay, and you're paying to be protected. So that way, if you do something negligent, you do something stupid, you are going to be protected by your insurance policy and you don't have to worry about losing your house, your home, your cars, your business, whatever it is. There are a lot of times, there are a lot of times that the injuries to a person and the overall value of a case, however you're valuing it, medical bills, pain and suffering, all that stuff, lost wages, future medicals, go ahead. That that is more than the customer's policy limits. So that's more than the defendant's available insurance. Now remember in your head, remember, when you send a policy limits demand for let's just say $50,000, and you think it's clear that the case is worth $500,000. You are agreeing to take the $50,000, your client is, agreeing to take that $50,000 because it's guaranteed, it's there, it's collectible money. And you're willing to do that in exchange for not trying to go get that $500,000, which may not be collectible. So you're making that, your, your client taking a huge discount in order to get the money that's available. The insurance company's job is to make sure that if they can settle the case within their customer's policy limits, that they should. So if the case is worth more than the policy limits and the insurance company has an opportunity to settle it within the policy limits, so that $500,000 case, you send a $50,000 demand, you should be able, you should be able to get that $50,000 because the insurance company should protect their customer by saying, we'll pay the $50,000 
That way you customer who's paid us all these years, premiums, you're not, don't have to worry about losing your house, your car, your savings, your business. Where bad faith comes in is when the insurance company fails to settle the case by doing one of two things, and usually they're combined. Acting negligently by failing to properly investigate, properly or reasonably uh, determine whether the demand should be paid, and or the insurance company puts their interests in saving money ahead of their customer's interest in being protected. So the insurance company is saying, yeah, that case probably is worth 50,000 or excuse me, $500,000. But, you know, I bet we could settle it for 45. So let's try and save $5,000 and we'll deny the $50,000 demand. And we'll offer 45 and see if we can get a little bit of a discount. That's the insurance company deciding that their financial interests are more important than their customers. And the insurance company has a fiduciary duty, a responsibility to make sure that they protect their customers. So when that happens, the phrase you hear is that the insurance company acted in bad faith. I prefer to say that they negligently failed to settle. It may just be a language difference, but acting in bad faith seems worse seems like a harder thing to prove than they negligently failed to settle. So I prefer to take the lower bar and hopefully, ex hopefully exceed that as opposed to making, the, making it more difficult on myself, at least mentally. So what happens after you send that policy limits demand and it's denied? And again, we're talking about cases where the value is well above the policy limits. So the value has to be substantially more than the policy limits, and that has to be very clear. And I'll talk about how you do that. But let's assume that premise for now. So what do you do after that happens? So the insurance company has decided we're not going to pay. We're not going to do that. And we now have Austin joining. That's awesome. We'll get to him in one sec. Welcome. That's not Scott Van Pelt, people. That's Austin Bersinger. Um, so what happens when the insurance company fails to settle the case when they should, that's when you file a lawsuit or continue the lawsuit, go get a verdict as for as much as you possibly can. That verdict, if it's above, if it's more than the insurance company's policy limits, that's called an excess judgment, an excess judgment. And that's because it's an excess of the insurance company's policy limits. And then we'll talk about the procedure at the end with Austin, because he's a true expert in this. Um, he has great timing, apparently. We'll talk about the process by which uh, you then go ahead with the bad faith lawsuit. So there's a second lawsuit that you will bring on behalf of the customer, on behalf of the injured, excuse me, on behalf of the defendant, the at-fault driver, for example, in a car crash. You will bring a lawsuit against uh, the insurance company who failed to settle on behalf of their insured. So, Austin Bersinger, welcome. Thank you, Mike. Um, I will try. I will try not to embarrass you, and I will try not to embarrass me. I am so excited about this, though, um, to have you on here. One, because I think it's just fun to me. But second, I, you really, I mean, you do know all this stuff, and I think it's going to be a huge benefit. So real briefly, why don't you tell everybody who the heck you are, what you do, I know you were just, I told some of these people, you were on an important call 15 minutes ago. So tell us what you're up to. <laughs> All right. So I think uh, what Mike probably already told you is that I'm a policyholder insurance recovery attorney. And what that means is that all I do is insurance coverage. You know, my background uh, after I was uh, in the military as a JAG officer at law school is that I worked at Denton's and before Denton's, McKenna Log and Aldridge. Uh, doing nothing but insurance coverage work for large insurance carriers. So now I have flip sides, and what I do is I represent uh, businesses and their uh, insurance coverage issues. I do bad faith in uh, insurance coverage on the plaintiff side. And, you know, really, all day, every day, I'm staring at insurance policies, and insurance coverage lit really is contract lit. And, uh, you know, I think as Mike would tell you, it's, it's pretty specialized. So when we get into kind of you know, the bad faith issues and how you need to look at this, you, you need to know that there's, there's another 
level of complexity to this claim. And, and what we're really trying to tell you is we're trying to tell you how to avoid the pitfalls and how to check the boxes to make sure you preserve these, these potential very large uh, verdicts. So I think with that, Mike. Yeah, we, were, we talked, um, admittedly, you and I did not spend a ton of time preparing because we, we were talking about a case yesterday, um, a, a legitimate case that we, had, that, that we think we may be able to be in the bad faith world. Um, but you said something to me interesting that I thought was really helpful and I wanted to share with everybody, which was that the major hurdle here is just following the rules and making sure that you do everything right. So I, I know you were talking to me about 9-11-67.1. Uh, 9-11-67.1, everybody, for car accident cases pre-suit is the starting point. Um, you have to follow 9-11-67.1. Uh, and if you don't, your demand's no good. So Austin, tell us about what insurers are doing to make sure that you're actually following the statute in pre-suit car accident cases. So I think what insurers are doing, and here's what I tell any plaintiff's attorney, if you are going to draft a demand, car accident case, a negligent security case, whatever you're doing, you need to pull this statute up. Because what I see, the pitfalls that people fall into is that they try to get cute. I mean, you know, you, you know that you need 30 days on the demand. You know you need to put what conditions are going to be released. You know that you need to make your demand capable of acceptance. I think when a lot of plan attorneys that don't do this every day hear that, they start to get creative. And, and like, if, I, if you don't take anything from this call, take this. I don't want you to be creative. I want you to be <laughs> play checkers and just check the boxes because that's the way you're going to preserve your right to recovery. You know, and a lot of times we're talking about a $50,000 policy that if you get to the excess verdict, we're well over a million. And it, and it comes down to what did you do in your initial demand letter? And so, you know, pull the statute up. And I mean, you know, we can kind of go through the actual just, just checks. You know, one is how much time do you have to accept the offer? Check. Yeah. Can't be less than 30 days. How much money do you want? Check. What's the release look like? What's the type of release? Check. What, what, what claim? What, yeah, yeah, what sorry. claims? You're about to say it. What claims are being released? So, you know, you need to say whether it's, whether it's the personal injury claim, the bodily, or excuse me, the property damage claim, what is and what's not. Um, I've never heard anybody say that, actually. I think that's pretty interesting about play checkers because you hear, and that's part of the reason I wanted to do this webinar, is you hear so many people trying to make this shit really, really, really complicated and mystical and difficult. And the reality is you write the terms on a piece of paper. You make sure that the terms follow 9-11-67.1 if you're in a pre-suit car accident case. I know your recommendation and mine is follow that all the time, regardless of, what, regardless of its case type. Um, but, and then give the insurance company the opportunity to do their job or not. You know, I mean, that seems like the plan. Yeah, and I think to build on this, and this is what a lot of people that aren't in this every day don't understand. And, and, and like, this is a great takeaway. Insurance companies screw up all the time. <laughs> you don't have to make believe and build a circus around an imaginary mess up because literally you're taking these huge companies that are cutting costs everywhere. They're completely understaffed. Like they miss things. They do put letters in desk drawers. They do miss demands all the time your job is not to trap anyone your job is to expose what they already missed and the way you do that is by being able to get to a jury one day and say listen i sent this two-page letter that said do this you've got 30 days this is how much i want these are the claims you know what they did nothing right and you know when you get cute and you put 30 conditions in there and and the jury or a judge says, man, they tried to trap these people, you lose your credibility. And that you've got to keep the moral high ground if you get to that point. Like that's the whole point of, of getting these excess judgments. You're convincing this insurance company to play fair. All right, I'll, I'll give the other side of things and I'll tell you some cute things I do. I, my, my thing on here, my shtick is I tell everybody truly what I do. So I'll, you tell me what you think. Um, I've got two demands, two form demands that we use in car crash cases. One is a skinny demand which if I've got medical bills, easy example, I've got medical bills of $200,000 and I got a $25,000 policy limits. 
I'm going to send my skinny demand. It's going to accomplish everything that the statute requires, but I am not going to go step by step through the treatment. I'm not going to go in a large um, or extended discussion about liability and negligence and the value of the case. It's pretty damn obvious that that case is well over $25,000. So I don't want to send off big alarms by saying, you know, I'm sending a 15 page demand and, and really selling my case. Cause I don't have to do that. You know, interestingly, what the statute doesn't require is you to do what we all do, have a paragraph or something, a section that says, this is the liability, have a section that says damages and goes through all the treatment, have a section that, you know, it doesn't require any of that. We do that to get paid. So I have a demand that I don't do all that, that I call it the skinny. And it's just a very simple, I'm going to meet the requirements. I'm going to give you the evidence that you need, the medical records, the bills. I'm not, I may not even put in a chart of how much the medical bills are. Go read the medical bills yourself, insurance company. So I do that. Do you, what do you think about an idea like that? I like it. I, I, I don't think your job uh, is to do their homework. You know, what I would say is I would probably drop footnotes to see, you know, treatment plan, C, incurred expenses. Because I don't think, I like the idea of it being two pages. I love the idea of it being super simple. I think you've got to, you've got to throw a sentence in there that says, please review all of the things already in front of your face. Yeah. And yeah, but that, that's my only input. I, I like it, especially on a twenty five fifty policy. That's, that's great. And then we've got, then we've got demands. I mean, we sent one, Chris Jackson my office sent one two days ago that I think was 30 pages because it's a $6 million policy. We want the 6 million. I truly want them to pay. So, you know, we, it's a different demand. Um, we're running through some of the things that you have to have to do. And one question we got was the 30 days. Is it 30 days from when? I don't know if there's a great answer. Maybe you do, but I know the safest thing, I think at least the safest thing is to say 30 days from the date you receive this in the mail and send it. You have to send it certified mail. Um, I know a lot of defense lawyers will go by the date that they received it if you email it to them. But my advice is if you think you have a case that's above the policy limits, why would you email it to them? Like why, why would you give them multiple ways to get it, send it through the mail, let them lose it on the mailroom floor, and then you're, you're fine. Uh, I, I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to practice what I preach here. I'm going to send you back to the statute because <laughs> number one is the time period within which such an offer should be accepted should be no less than 30 days from receipt of the offer, which to your point is, yeah, send it certified, get it stamped so you know, you know what day they got it, and then start your clock. Your clock is the day they got it, 30 days from then. Yeah. Um, so we've got yeah. 30 days. You have to say how much you want, which you should be doing anyway. You have to say who is released um, and you need to consider whether your client is married or not because sometimes that will factor in whether they, you need to release other claims for loss of consortium or things like that. You have to say what claims are released. Um, you have to give terms. Now, let's talk about some of these terms. Um, and I guess before we get there, let me bounce back one second, which is, and I'm looking at my notes here. you don't have to include a release, right? I mean, it's, it's up to you whether you're going to say to insurance company, here are all of the terms in a release form, or you have to give me a release, right? You can do one of the two. You can do one of the two. Cause what I we, like the release. So what we do, especially, and again, here's behind the curtain in cases that we don't want demands to be paid, that I want them to, to, to fail. I, we make an act of the settlement, an act, a requirement of settlement for them to provide us a release with the following terms. And we'll use quotation marks for certain terms that we think are very important. Um, but generally, if I want the demand paid um, and there's not any issues, I send my own release. But we go back and forth about this. Sometimes we send a release with it and say, you have to agree to all these terms. Sometimes we don't. But let's talk about some of the terms. Um, I don't want to get too deep into subrogation and liens and things like that. I know you're, I know you're in a wormhole right now in a case you're working on about that, but can you briefly talk to everybody about liens and the Wellstar case and the, how that all works? 
<laughs> I see your face. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so basically, here's the thing. And if there are outstanding liens, the insurance company has a right to ask you how those are going to be handled. And if you don't address that in your demand, then they have a right of clarification currently with you. So basically, if you don't address the liens in your demand letter, they've got an argument to suggest, hey, we had to have clarification. We couldn't do this without clarification. And so now you don't have a valid demand going into a bad faith case. Yeah. So, so if you go back to Wellstar and you look at the safe harbor, uh, safe harbor policy uh, provisions, you know it's for outstanding liens. Go ahead. I'm losing you a little bit on connection, so let's see if we can catch back up here. Um, okay. So what I'm hearing from you is that when there are liens or bills or whatever it is that may um, that may exceed the policy limits, especially that the insurance company has a right to know how you're going to handle those. How are you going to get everybody paid if they settle the case, right? Correct. Um, we, we've talked before about ways to handle this. And I think the way to handle it is to just tell the insurance company exactly what you're going to do. What we say is we will indemnify the insurance company. We'll defend them for all valid and enforceable liens up to the amount of settlement, um, less costs. So it's basically what my client pockets, how much money they get. I'm not going to put my client on the hook for a million dollars if they only got 500. Um, and we tell them that way they don't need any clarification. Or we tell them that we'll with that the lawyers will hold all uh, the proceeds until we satisfy all the liens. Would that if I if I solve their problem, does that take away the does that take away their need to seek clarification? One would expect the answer to be yes. <laughs> would they still try it? Probably. I think the longer answer here is, you know, Wellstar is only for real liens. And so one thing you can do is, I mean, do a lien search. I mean, that's kind of the whole game, even on the carrier side, is you can put in there, hey, do a lien search. Um, and at that point, you've said, both on your side and their side, how you would perfect the condition. You know, to the extent there are liens, however, as of this date, we searched and there are no outstanding liens. I mean, I think you can spell that out and protect yourself. Yeah, so I think where this goes is if you handle the lien problem up front, if you tell the insurance company how you're going to solve the liens, either you say, there are no liens, don't ask me any questions about liens. Two, if there are liens, here's how we're going to handle them. I'm either going to pay them as the lawyer or my client will promise to indemnify. And then they don't pay because they, they're mad about liens. I think the response there is you weren't acting in good faith. You're putting your interests ahead of your clients, right? I mean, that's the idea. That is the idea. There, there's a, I mean, this is not like an inside baseball thing. There's an there's a appeal right now in a case called Kemper that is all about whether or not imaginary liens were a reason not to accept a demand. Uh, the district court decided that that was a reason, and now we're going to find out. But I, I'll just say like that, you know, one thing that you need to do if you're doing a lot of these, you need to go read the Kemper case because I think you need to change your demands around what that court kind of talked about. And it's and it lean specific, right? And a lot of these BI claims, you know, whether they have an active lean one day versus the other is real, right? It's what happens on the day you did the search. So yeah, what do you think about that, Mike? No, I think you're right. I mean, I'd add the, the Wellstar case um, because that talks about the safe harbor, which Kemper then builds on. Um, so I think, I mean, and are you on the good side or the bad side of that case, Austin, on the Kemper one? Who are you briefing it for? Um, I am, well, I'm not, I'm not active in that case, Mike, but, uh, it would be, I mean, obviously good guys only here. Can't, <laughs> can't rough. <rest. laughs> All right. So, so let's keep talking about some of the terms that will give an insurance company an opportunity to, to, to fail. Cause that's all it is. And when I say an opportunity, I truly mean a fair opportunity. Um, sure. I always add in language that the client is not made whole the client is not made whole. And the reason you do that is because if, if the health insurance needs, uh, needs to be paid back, uh, if it's a non ERISA plan, then state law will govern. And if the client isn't made whole, you don't have to pay that health insurance back. 
Um, another term I use is that the money is for sickness and injury, sickness and injury. And the reason for that is taxation. Uh, if it's for, if it's for lost wages, your client will technically have to pay taxes on that. So we make the payment for sickness and injury, but make sure you're releasing all bodily injury claims. That's what you intend to do, uh, including lost wages. So we've got these terms. We've written them down. We've sent a 30 day demand or longer. I'll tell you what I like to do if possible. I like to actually do date certain demands. That way there's no confusion at all. So I'll pick 42 days away from when I'm mailing it, knowing they're gonna get it. And then it's a very date certain thing. Um, so the insurance company has 30 days to accept, right? Yeah. What do you think about this term? This is one we use. Uh, our term is that on the 30th day, the insurance company has to tell us in writing that they, one, will agree to pay us the money, and two, that they either agree to the terms in our release without any change, or that they will provide the release within 10 more days with the terms that we want in it. What do you think about that? Um, I mean, I like it, except I don't understand why on the 30th day is more relevant than within the 30 day window. Okay. Well, I mean, yeah, I within, think, within, yeah. within, by. Yeah, by yeah, yeah. No, no, I think that's fine. And I think that's, uh, you know, it goes back to what we talked about to, to begin with and that's you made it simple, right? I mean, you could, it, the bottom line is if you can't bullet point these sentences and say, I need you to just do X, check it, do X, like that is the way to keep yourself playing well. I've got a case right now where we did that and the, um, the response was, we accept, we, we, we agree to pay you whatever the amount was. We agree to pay you the amount. And that was the acceptance letter, it was the form acceptance letter. And it didn't say we agree to your terms. So, you know, we've got that issue going on right now, which my rule of thumb is I feel comfortable standing in front of a judge and saying, judge, it's term 2.2. There's only five terms. Right. They didn't do this. Um, let's look at what else I got on my list here. Uh, there's also something called an affidavit of no other insurance that you can require a... Um, an insurance company in reality, the defendant or their, their insured to, to, to complete. So my fear here, and Austin, I don't know if you have any experience or have worked on cases where you're told that, or maybe, maybe your former clients were telling people that there's only a hundred thousand dollars of insurance. And then you find out 60 days later that there's a million dollar excess or umbrella policy that nobody told you about. So I'm right. always worried about that. Sure. So what we do is we have an affidavit of no other insurance, which is, I'll send it out to everybody, by the way, but it requires the insurer to say, I've searched all of my, my policies and this is all I got. All I have is this $100,000. Um, we had a question from Michael Kaufman actually about what happens when the insurance company can't return the release, or excuse me, can't return the affidavit of no other insurance because they say that the insured, they can't find the insured and they can't get the insured to do that. To me, that isn't bad faith because the insured is not, is not the, the insurance company is not a failing their insured. It's the insured who's actually failing. What do you think about that concept, that idea? Seems logical. I haven't really thought about it that much. And I, you know, I, I think at that point, they're in a tripartite relationship. I feel like the carrier is actually active in that, right? So part of the idea with the carrier is how are you going to go up or down the ladder? Is there an excess policy? Do you have to give notice to the excess carrier? So I don't know if I would let the carrier off the hook. I agree with you that it is the actual insured or defendant who's making the mistake, but uh, I agree with you. Yeah, I think I think one way, um, one way to solve that maybe is to... Uh, is to ask them, how did you look for the insured? I mean, if the insured doesn't have a lawyer, call up the insured yourself. Their number may be on the police report. You can you know, run a background search and say, you know, if you find them in 10 minutes and you say, has your insurance company been trying to get in contact with you? And they say, no. I mean, you got a much better case that the insurance company was just being lazy. Um, you know, I'm not accepting an affidavit of no other insurance from the insurance company because they don't know right. if the guy has policies with other companies. I mean, they, they're not sure. 
So Austin, you send this demand, it's got whatever the terms you want and they don't accept it or they try to change a term. So can you walk people through what a rejection is compared to clarification? I know that's a tough question, but can you draw some lines somewhere about the difference? I think anytime they don't agree to a material term, anytime they, they say, you know, a classic one is you released one person, but not two. And then they come back to you with, whoa, what is that? Does one mean one? Like that's a rejection. And so I think, you know, in practice, how this actually happens is that I think, I think there's going to be arguments. I think we're going to say things like, no, that wasn't a clarification. That was a rejection. I think our default on our side where we kind of live is, well, that's a rejection. You know, do I think, what I always think about with these is like, well, what happens if, what happens if you just call? If I'm the defense attorney and I call the plaintiff's attorney and I say, hey, what does this mean? You know, where are we then? I, you know, I don't talk about that. I don't think you answer the phone. I mean, honestly, like right. we, no, no, I say that for, for, I say that for real. I mean, we've got a couple demands out where there's instructions from me to everybody in my firm. If someone calls, be very nice to them, take a message, but my demand says what it says. And there is no reason for you to need clarification. Um, Cause I want, I don't want to have that conversation over the phone. I want to have you send me an email asking whatever the question is that you want to ask. And then, you know, I'll call somebody like you and say, is this clarification or is this, is this not? Right. Right. And I think we can all like agree. Um, it, it's, so, so here's my like question is, does that have a chilling effect on settlement generally? Yeah. And you know, if I'm at an insurance defense shop and my, my number one answer is of course it does. But to be clear, you know, whether it's day 28, day 30, you said what your terms are. I mean, it's basic contract law, offer acceptance. If you didn't accept it, you rejected it. So I think as we keep going, as we keep getting more case law on this, what we're going to find is that there is less and less room for clarification. Yeah. Um, so let's say you've got a case where, uh, where there's two insurance companies involved and one of them uh, tenders maybe their first million dollars, easy numbers. And then there's another policy, let's again, easy numbers with $5 million. So the 1 million says we'll pay. And the 5 million says we're still thinking about it. Um, my recommendation in those instances, we have multiple layers, is to answer all of the questions that, that that 5 million has. So if they see clarification and give them another chance. And I'm gonna show everybody here, um, I'm gonna show everybody something that we wrote literally. What is this? What's today? May 21st? This was two days ago. So you can see this, this demand is outstanding right now. Is there something wrong with me putting this up, by the way? Am I okay? Uh, honestly, it's a uh, property of your client, but otherwise you should be okay. Yeah, well, so here we go. So what we did was I'm writing this demand to the two insurance companies and we explain that one of them right. says they have enough information and one of them says they don't, right? And then right. we compare the two. We, I called it the tale of two insurance companies here. So I'm trying to play them off each other. But the truth is that when they asked, when the, when the second layer asked for a clarification, when they asked for information, they said, we can't, we can't settle your case because we don't know enough. I don't think they were wrong. So in that case, I think you got to send a second demand explaining everything, right? I mean, you just need to be reasonable. Sorry, I have got just That's bogged fine. down in the reading. Um, <laughs> well, I, I've read this now. So, so well, what? The, the, where I'm going with this is just in general, you know, we sent a second demand here trying to answer a ton of questions that the insurance company had. Um, okay. And we give them a second chance. Sure. I think that more demands means a better chance at bad faith, a, a better, a more compelling argument. Do you agree with that? I mean, I, I always thought if they reject one or two, that's not as good as if they reject 22 demands. I agree with that. I, I think in this, so there's a couple, there's a couple subtleties here. One is I think the 
choice to settle on the 1 million primary is so much more clear cut than it is on the excess policy, yeah. right? And so let's say your, your primary insurer denied or didn't pay. Well, then I think on that policy, like you've got a great bad faith argument. But if you got the excess layer saying, listen, um, all in the value of the life with the damages is 4.5, both policies are six, you know, can they defend on it just didn't get to the number? Yeah, I think they probably, they, they would, they would. I mean, whether or not, whether or not that matters and whether or not you still have an argument bad faith, you know, existed or happened. I mean, kind of what I would be thinking there is, can you get contour out so that you can just take aim at, at the excess, right? Yeah. So what I'm highlighting here is that, you know, we told, we're, we're very upfront. We said, look, we spent five and a half months getting more evidence and answering all your questions. Now, if you don't accept, we will get an excess verdict and you will fail, your insured will face serious problems. They will have okay. to lay off employees, reduce pay and benefits, sell assets, and they may even be bankrupt. So sure. where I'm going with this big picture is you need a compelling story. You need, because you have this second trial, and let's talk about that, about how you have to win a second trial against the insurance company, and you need a good story, hopefully the truth, to show that they didn't act reasonably, the insurance company didn't act reasonably. So let me start with this. Can you tell everybody the process? I've got a $50,000 policy, or somebody does. I go and get, I send a $50,000 demand. It is, not, it is not accepted even though it complies with everything. It's clear as day that the case is worth millions. And I go and get a verdict with, for millions of dollars. What happens then? How do I go get the rest of the money? Well, I, I think one of the one of the questions is whether there is a covenant covenant not to execute executed with the underlying defendant and an assignment of the right to sue the carrier, right? right so you slow down, slow down, slow down. What what are those things? Okay, so a covenant not to execute is where you get a five million dollar verdict or whatever your verdict is, and you go to the defendant and you say, Hey, you owe me five million dollars. It looks like you have fifty bucks. Can, will you assign this lawsuit to me and the ability to sue the carrier for bad faith in exchange for me not trying to collect on the $5 million verdict? Yeah, so I won't try and bankrupt you if you give me the claim and let me prosecute that claim against your own insurance company for screwing you by not settling the case within the policy limits, right? Correct. All right, and then me, the plaintiff's lawyer who was representing the injured the, the person who is physically injured, I now represent, at least on the caption of the case, I represent the at-fault driver, the underinsured person, right? Correct. All right. And what do I do? I mean, what's the next step? <laughs> the next, uh, next step is to determine venue. Uh, sure particularly with carriers, they like to be in federal court. I will tell you that a lot of these cases, you can't stop them from removing. Um, and, and honestly, you know, you and me talking about this and in these kind of cases, why these scare people, and like, frankly, they probably should, is federal court's just a ball game that a lot of people aren't comfortable with. And so you need to know that like, these are gonna be brief, heavy cases. Um, and you're gonna get balls and strikes called. So, you know, I think you go get that one five verdict and you're sitting there going, well, how do I just get the one five quickly? It's not going to be that easy. We're probably still 18, two years out, 18 months, two years out. And you're probably going to live or die on summary judgment. So kind of you, what do we do next? Expert. And you need an expert, right? I mean, you're typically you typically hiring. Expert. Tell me Correct. about who, who the, the experts, not names necessarily. Actually, one of them signed up for this. Somebody I've used now, I'll, I'll, Peter Hillbrand, I think is one of the best, but um, who, who are some of the, who, who are we looking for? What category of people are you looking for to be an expert in this second bad faith case where you're trying to show that the insurance company didn't do right by their customer? Right, it's claim handling. It's how do you actually handle the claim? That would be, you know, a lot of times it's people that have 20 years of claims experience. Yeah. Uh, you know, one thing we should probably talk about is 
there's a lot of ways to play these policies, not, not policies, but to play the bad faith cases where you can stagger them in the second lawsuit. So like, what I like to do is I like to have the first fight be, should you have covered the claim? Was there a duty to defend, duty to identify? And what you want to be thinking about is like, once you won the first war, now you're just playing for the, for the excess verdict and your attorney's fees. So you can set this up where you're not incurring expert costs, you're not doing crazy extensive ex ex discovery because you already have it from the underlying case, and you, just, you should be able to get summary judgment in five months. So right, well, that's kind of, on a uh, practical matter, what you should be thinking about. Let me explain that second part a little bit, or at least the two parts, to make sure everybody's with us. So the first part, the sure. first question you have to answer is, did the insurance company mess up? Should they have paid the money, right? Did they have a duty to? Did they have an obligation to? And was the case, case clearly worth more, whereby the insurance company was unreasonable by not paying demand? So that's the first part, right? Yeah. At least that can be the first part if you do it this way. The, the yes. second part is how much money are you going to get? Because you in that second case, in the bad faith case, the jury will know, the jury is told, look, because the insurance company didn't um, pay, now there's a $1.5 million verdict and poor, poor Nancy over here has to pay $1.5 million. They don't know about the assignment, right? They believe, they're told that Nancy, the, the insured, is responsible for that full 1.5 million, right? Uh, I've seen it. I've seen it both ways. I mean, a lot of times they know um, because it's in the caption itself, right? So if you get to that point, usually on the first half, you know, you're on summary judgment in front of the judge. So it's not, it, it's really, it's really pretty clear, right? Is there a duty to defend based on the allegations in the complaint? Where it gets hairy, um, and this, I mean, this is when you need subject matter experts as phase two, because what you're really trying to do is you need industry knowledge to say, listen, I know how your claim file works. I know what you did. I know what you didn't do. And these are the 20 things I know I need to put in front of a jury. And, and that's based on what do you know about how the insurance company conducts their everyday business. But it's all there. I mean, you know, like, the problem for the carrier is, yes, you are documenting everything, but it also means everything's in a system, right? And, and at the end of the day, the jury gets to decide in that bad faith case, how much money is going to be assessed against the insurance company. They have the right to award less than the verdict. They can award the verdict. They can even award more than the verdict to penalize the insurance company, right? Right. You've definitely got punitives in play on, on phase two. So I've, I've been, you know, uh, I, I've been, I was about to say lucky enough, um, but I've, I've deposed a bunch of adjusters in these bad faith cases. And I will tell you, if you are prepared, it's, you're laughing. It's the best thing. I mean, I had, I, I, you may know this story, but I'll, I'll share with everybody. I had a case where um, State Farm had farmed out their adjusting, their, their, their claims to a third party. That doesn't really matter, except for the fact that the guy that was adjusting the claims lived in Oklahoma literally down by the river in an airstream or some like some, you know, some, I don't know, mobile home, which is fine. As long as you do your work properly and protect people. But I remember saying to this guy, you know, sir, the case was in Clayton County, um, which is I mean, the, probably the best, the second best venue in Georgia for, for personal injury claims generally. Um, and I said to him, you know, tell me what you know about Clayton County. What, how was that as a venue? And his response was, I don't know. I don't consider venue. Doesn't matter to me. I mean, that blew my mind that this guy who's supposed to be determining the value of the case isn't looking at venue. I, I feel like when you get to that deposition, like there's just a couple like freebie questions like, sir, how many claims are you currently handling? <laughs> Nine million. And the question will be, <laughs> yeah, it'll be nuts. It'll be like, oh, right now, probably 4,000. And you'll be like, how much time did you spend on this one? And, and like, you know, they'll kind of say like, oh, well, you know, the exact amount of time that this claim took. And you're like, no, no, I need to know minutes. Like the initial review, how much time was that? And you just, it will blow your mind. So it'll make you hate buying insurance. <laughs> so, so this is a long process because you need to send the demand and give them at least 30 days way back when you right. got to get them to, 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 I don't want to, I mean, people say below them and you got to get them to not accept it or they have to choose not to accept it. There's nothing you can do to control whether they accept the demand or not. You then, if you're pre-suit, you've got to file suit, go through the entire 
first trial of the underlying crash or whatever it is, you have to win that, get the claim assigned to you, file a second demand, which is you're usually, I mean, I just file them in federal court because you're going to end up there. So you're in federal court, you have all these deadlines, you have expert deadlines, you have, and you got to go through, you know, briefing hell for the most part. And then you have to win that trial with a compelling story. I mean, it still goes back to, you need to have a compelling story that the insured got screwed, that they weren't treated fairly, right? Sure. So we're talking, I mean, we're talking three, four, five years, depending on, I mean, three years seems pretty, pretty quick to me, honestly. I agree with that. I mean, right now, most of these bad faith cases are probably from 2015 accidents. So, yeah. you know, all in, I mean, it could be four or five and you've got to determine, and that's kind of the game for the, for the insurance carrier side is, you know, you file this bad faith case and they'll say, well, do you want your money now? We'll pay for the, you know, we'll pay for the within policy limits part of the verdict. And, you know, those are tough choices sometimes. I mean, particularly if it's a million dollar policy and, you know, you want three, but you can get, you can get one tomorrow. So the time value of money really matters in these cases, it seems like. I mean, it, it, sure. I, I've taken, you know, I've taken less than what the demand amount was or what I thought the case value was because I said to the client, y'all don't want to wait four years. Um, you know, this is going to take a really right. long time. And there's always risk. You know, there's always risk because I think you can tell everybody that the landscape of these bad faith analysis, the, uh, the, the, the way you were going about seeing if bad faith actually happened is truly changing all the time. I think it's, that's definitely true. And I think particularly when the economy goes down, which it's about to, or, you know, speculating. Uh, I don't know what you're, you're see- living in if the economy hasn't gone down yet. I mean, I, you're, <laughs> I don't know, that nice painting and all those books behind you, you're living large. I've got, got like a hundred dollar couch behind me. Go ahead. But you've got two paintings. I've only got one painting. A great big canvas dot. All right. And, I, and actually, somebody was just giving me crap via, via text before I started telling me I need to upgrade my paint game. But anyway, um, so, I mean, yeah. tell, tell us about, like, I mean, I'm always worried, I guess, that I'm going to give client advice. And then two years later, the law is going to change and I'm going to have to say, oh, shit, you know, uh, that's not true anymore. Well, I don't think, my worry wouldn't be the law change because you're going to have the applicable law that was in force at the time, okay. you know, the bad faith demand went out. But what I will say is, and what I was kind of getting at with the economy stuff is you, you're seeing carriers become more aggressive. So what I, what I would tell anyone listening today is start to get this on your radar because there's going to be far more actions that constitute bad faith when carriers are trying to cut corners and save money. And, you know, back to Mike's original question, listen, I think of bad faith insurance law like I think of bankruptcy like I think of like other high-end you know just kind of very specialized rules I would not dabble in this you know you want to call Mike you want to call me because you don't want to not put the checkers in the way they need to be and know what the game is but what everyone on this chat whether you're a defense lawyer whether you're an insurance company if I'm educating y'all that's awesome whether you're a plaintiff's lawyer you need to be an expert in 9 11 67.1 um, because you, you need Agreed. to know if, I mean, that, that is something that has to be in your toolbox. If you're a plaintiff's lawyer, it has to be right. I mean, that everybody should conquer that. Step one. Yeah. yeah I mean, that, that statute should be printed out, laminated, put it on your desk. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, my, I, I'm just going to say, I, I get, I get calls all the time that, that folks say they're in bad faith or that they think there's bad faith. And then I look and it's, it, that it, it just didn't comply with the statute. And, I, I feel like I, I, I don't want to waste time just coming back to follow the fucking statute. That's the first time I think I said fuck on the podcast or on, on this webinar, but sorry. But I, I guess I'm, I'm not edgy. sorry. It's, edgy. I'm not sorry. It's mine. Edgy. I'm not sorry. I I'm like not it. At all. It's mine. Um, but follow the stat. I mean, if you can't do that, I'm going to be honest, you shouldn't be a lawyer. Like you shouldn't, you're, you're failing your clients. Yeah. And, and let me just like circle back something you asked about earlier. We're talking about bad faith cases and, and how we're gonna protect the narrative and how we were gonna tell a story. Like, I'll tell you this, most of these cases, the story tells itself because it, it always is gonna be a faceless multi-billion dollar company 
choosing not to protect the interests of a person that already paid the premium to the to the company. Like it's very clear that you know they either did the thing that they they contracted to do or they didn't, and you know that tends to set it set up, set itself up well. So I say that to say something I said in the first five minutes, which is do not make this three-dimensional chess. Do not sit around and try to get creative. When, it, when I see mistakes happen, it's that. You can get creative though outside the statute. And what I mean by that, and I think what you should do, is in your demands, and I've said this before, in your demands, you should be speaking to the insurance company about protecting their insured. So that way, when you have a bad faith Agreed. trial later, you're typically exhibit one is your demand. And you wanna look like, a, like the Oracle, where you're telling the insurance company three years earlier, hey guys, if you don't pay this demand, your insurance is going to be screwed. And by the way, and here's, here's something that I haven't mentioned yet, you need to really be selling and showing that, it's, that the case is worth more than the excess policy. And the way you're going to do that is you're going to look at the medical bills, you're going to look at pain and suffering, photos, whatever you got. I also recommend using case research. Um, you, know, you can pull up you know, bad faith verdicts from that specific insurance company and show them. So, I mean, here right now, this is the same demand that I sent out, um, or this is information from the same demand. We, we sent a first demand. What I did was I asked for in this email um, from Case Metrics, I said, give me all of the, the verdicts that were very similar to my facts. And what I'll get is a list of reports. And you can see that I've got reports from 1 million to $15 million. So do I choose the ones that are a million when I have a $6 million policy? No, but I show them all the ones that are above. And what I can tell from this one, for example, is, and luckily I can send some of my own, which is nice, but I can see that uh, Virgil Adams and James Jordan, they got a verdict for $15 million in a nightclub shooting a wrongful death case. Now mine might be a car accident, but I can say, hey, here's the value of, of a male African-American who's 20 years old. So I can do things to make the case more compelling. So I, I wanted to bring that up because I think on one hand, you have to play it safe with the statute. On the other hand, I think you want to be creative and you want to do things to really put the insurance company in a box. And one thing is speaking directly to them and saying, if you mess up, if you don't pay this, there's going to be a bad faith case. Your insured's going to be screwed. I mean, I, I think that really helps because later down the road, or even in the short term, the adjusters reading that and bells are going off and they're going, oh shit, these people are serious. They know what they're doing. You know, so much of the time with the carrier game, you need to do just enough in the letter for that adjuster to throw it up to their supervisor. Because like, you gotta remember, these adjusters are seeing hundreds of claims a day, they're taking 30 seconds to read your letter, and you need to get their attention just enough where they're like, I don't want this to come back on me. Like they, even if they're just doing a CYA, like get them to the next level. And you know, you've got so much better chance to get demand paid. Everybody's got a boss. And I firmly right. believe that life works on, um, I heard your boss, I heard Beth in the background when we were talking before. Uh, yeah. I firmly believe that everybody operates just not to get fired from their job. I mean, that is the number one self-preservation and self-interest I think is the natural human nature. So if you, you know, if you can get somebody, um, if you can use that, that mantra, or that thought um, to get someone to do either right or wrong by you, depending on what you want, um, I think that will help a ton. All right, Austin, what have we missed? Is there anything else that, that we should share with the good people out there? We've Looking gone an hour notes. without embarrassing each other. We've done great. <laughs> we have, we have. Um, <laughs> Trying to see if there's anything else that I wanted to share with everybody. Um, oh, here's maybe the most important thing that, that we've missed. Once the demand gets rejected, so you have this case, it's worth millions, and you have this small policy. The insurance company rejects the demand. Don't make another offer. <laughs> Don't give them another chance to right their wrong, because if not, you're blowing it up, right? I couldn't agree more. I mean, just don't do it. It's never going to work out in your favor. But do not do a, hey, you might have missed this. Because once, you, once you're there, you're there. Right. Yeah. Um, let's, see, uh, let's see if we can, uh, if we can just wrap, wrap up the takeaways here. And I think that before we jump to some questions, 
I think the takeaways are no matter what kind of lawyer you are, if you're in the personal injury world, you need to, I like what you said, laminate. Maybe I literally might do this. Laminate 911 67.1 and do it and, and follow. Agreed. Um, we haven't talked too much about what happens when you don't officially have to follow 911 67.1, which is either it's a car crash case and you've already filed suit or it's not a motor vehicle crash. Like we said, our advice is still follow 911 67.1 because the legislature has deemed this a deemed demands that follow those a reasonable demand. I, I'd rather do that than fight about, oh, my newfangled demand that doesn't meet the requirements of 911 67.1, even though it doesn't have to. That's okay too. I don't want to fight that fight. Yeah, so I mean, what you're getting at is, you know, for those kind of claims, you're still you're still under Holt, case called Holt. Yep. Um, I, again, don't get tricky. Do not read that case and say, I'm going to do this new creative thing. Just go back to your laminated statute, do that, and then we know we're protected. Because I will tell you, so many of these opportunities, so many of these judgments, these cases where this should be a bad faith case, get destroyed on the front end in the first 30 days because the demand wasn't effective. Yeah. It, That's my takeaway. Well, and I, and I think that the, the next step of the takeaway, which, which I'll add to yours is you need to follow the statute. I think there are things you can do to not put skywriting in the sky that says, I'm trying to get bad faith here. I'm trying to give you a chance to fail, but you can only do so much. You, you have to write the terms. You can be creative to some degree with the terms. I mean, like I said, we have two demands, uh, a skinny one, which meets the requirements and a full fledged, you know, bring in the army to, to, to take over and we want to get paid. We also have terms that will require us to, to, to for require the insurance company to um, give us a demand that meets the requirements that we've laid out which it's just another hurdle for them to jump, but it is a fair hurdle, right? I mean, it's fair. I agree. And then I think the, the big picture here is you have to go through the whole process. And when you, have, when you get a case that the insurance company has failed to settle, you got to take it all the way or play chicken at least and get to, get to the end of that first trial and, and hit the excess verdict because they might not, the insurance company might not trust you they might think, well, yeah, you know, that lawyer maybe hasn't tried a lot of cases, maybe doesn't have the experience. Yeah, typically the case would be worth a couple hundred thousand, but maybe they'll mess up. You know, so I think it benefits you to bring on somebody and have a team with you for that excess, for that verdict where you're trying to go in excess of the policy limits, right? I agree. And then, then the specialization of, of the bad faith case, that second case. Um, I, I've never done one alone. I don't think I ever will do one alone because there are so, so, so many pitfalls, whether it's just general federal court stuff or the, or the law that's constantly fluctuating. All right, Austin, tell the people something positive that they can take away and go forth and, you know, hopefully, one, be able to put insurance companies in situations where they may fail and to be able to recognize the failures. So I think what you've probably gotten from this call and what I would tell you, like if your one takeaway is, you know, outside printing out that statute is what I would do is I, I would look at your practice and I would look at, do you have a skinny like Mike has? Do you have a template for a longer one? And, and what I'll tell you is take the guesswork out of this. You know, you don't know if your best day is gonna be next Tuesday, but if you can write out one form letter and then riff off of that every time you send it, you're protected. So that, that would be my takeaway for how you should actually change your practice based on today's call. You know, also I'll tell you like what I told you earlier, insurance companies are going to make mistakes. There are going to be these opportunities. You don't have to create it from nothing. It's there. So, uh, you know, going forward, I mean, just hold them accountable and keep fighting your fights and good things will happen. Yeah. And, and my, my motivation here, my, my word of thought is, is you can be a master of 9-11-67.1 and you can, May, write demands. I mean, everybody's capable of doing this. You can write really strong demands. You can write demands that use jury research, that use um, you know great evidence within the demands. So that way, when the insurance company does mess up, I mean, they, and and some of the best cases I've ever had, I had no idea that the insurance company would even would mess up. I, I, it wasn't like I was trying to. You can't. 
I mean, you have to do certain things, but that way when it does happen, you're prepared and you're able to then go get the excess verdict and have a compelling case in the bad faith side of things by why the insurance company, how badly the insurance company messed up. So Austin, I appreciate, I truly appreciate you uh, joining us. Um, I appreciate you not saying bad things about me. Um, I appreciate you also not having a glare up, up top because I was worried about that. You know, some, some lighting. People will be- I thought about powdering it, my, you know, just to take the glare off of it. But uh, your hair looks great today, Mike. Yeah, it's, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of it. That's for sure. I, you know, it's covering up the small bald spot in the back. Um, what, uh, what my plan is, is to say goodbye to everybody and thank you all for joining me. I really, really appreciate it. Austin, if you're up for it, hang on for a few minutes. Let's answer some questions. Um, but, but thank you all for, for joining. I know a lot of y'all will go back to your day job here. But uh, we, I, I speak for Austin, I think. We had a great time doing this. It's a ton of fun. Hopefully you got one thing out of it, either that you didn't know or that maybe you did know and you forgot, maybe a new way of thinking about something. Um, we are here to help. We are here to help. I'm going to send you my contact information. I assume all of you, most of you have it, but I'm also going to send you Austin's um, and Austin, tell everybody that you will help them for free. At least, you know, at least at front. I mean, you're, you're, how much time do you spend giving free advice? I know I spend hours a day, truly. Call me. I'm always open to talk about things. All right, everybody. Thank you all. We really appreciate it. And we'll see you next webinar.